Okay, now I'm recording, so. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Were you able to fix the sermon? <laughs> From this past Sunday? No. Yeah. No, for whatever reason, it recorded the video, but not the audio. Um, so when I, t when I tuned in on Sunday, I couldn't get the audio. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what I did was I just shared the video of another one of my friends who also preached on Sunday, um, Carl. He's the videos on our Facebook page, um, and it's him preaching from the Presbyterian church that he's um, doing a stated supply at. So he actually, I like his sermon better than mine anyway. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's the nice thing about having different points of view on the same text. You end up with different <laughs> sermons. So, um, okay. So we're recapping the first article. Um, we talked about how God's creator of all, God gives security. Um, and that if we really believe this article, like if we truly confess this article to be true, then we wouldn't do things like going around and bragging about the material things that we have because we would realize that since God is the father and provider of all, that all things come from God. And so the things that we have up to and including this pin here are not actually ours. They're tools that have been given to us through God's grace for us to be able to do whatever God has equipped us to do in the world. Um, in this case, this pen was equipped to write the prayer list this evening. So it's probably fulfilled its purpose and we'll never use again. Um, so are there any questions about the first article that have cropped up since the last time we were together now that you've had a little bit of time to reflect on it? Going once, going twice, sold for free. All right, so let's move on to the second article, which is the chief article of our faith in just about every way possible. Because um, without this part, we wouldn't be Christians. So um, I'm going to read it. This is actually an older translation that I, I like the language a little bit. It's... The translation is not exact, but I like the language a little bit better. Um, so this is from uh, the old service book and hymnal. I don't know if any of you remember that. The SBH is the old red book that we used before the green book. Um, it came out in 58 and got retired in 78. Um, but this is the version there. So the second article. And, I, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. So, that's start with talking about some translation issues, um, which will help us understand why the new version that we use hush, plate, in the, in the service is different. So just for comparison, um, if you have the new version of the small catechism that we gave out, the, the one that's got the, not the brown cover, but the, the gray and yeah, not that one, Barbara, but the other one, um, the gray and red one. No, that'll still that'll still have the old one in it too. Um, I'm gonna read it so it's not a it's not a big deal. This one. Yeah, that one will probably have it in it. In the hymn, no. Yes. Okay. So. Da, da, da. All right. So the second article in the current um, hymnal is. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, not ghosts. So there's one translation issue. Um, born of the Virgin Mary, there's actually another translation issue there. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. There's another one. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God. Of, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
Notice the dropping of um, God the Father Almighty. And he will come to judge the living and the dead, not the quick and the dead. So let's talk about those. Most of them are minor. But, um, so the first one is ghost. The reason that we used to say Holy Ghost um, is because the Greek word that we get it from is pneuma or pneumatos, um, which is translated either ghost, spirit, or wind, depending on the context. Um, and since the idea of ghost and spirit are so close, Old English used ghost, which is why you'll see ghost in the King James Version. In modern times, people realized that, that ghost maybe wasn't the best translation just because ghost had taken on a new connotation within society where, you know, we're talking about like this ethereal thing that's haunting your house and moving your cups and, you know, trying to scare you. And so they figured they would start using spirit instead because that would better convey the fact that the Holy Spirit's not trying to steal your silverware. It's trying to help you live your life. Okay, so that's, that's the first one. Um, the second one is, is around the Virgin Mary. We'll save that one for a minute because there's, there's more to get into there. Um, so the second one is quick. So in our current translation, we talk about the living and the dead, not the quick and the dead. Um, the Greek word for that is uh, zontas, which, do you remember participles from English class? Yep, I don't have to use them. <laughs> so a participle is a verbal, is a, a, a noun adjective, a noun verb kind of thing. Um, basically, it's like describing a person and action all in one. So the, the best way to take that is zontas means one who is living or one who is alive, one who is moving. So the King James took it as quick, um, but nowadays we just say living because that, that's the idea of the, the participle. You're, you're alive and you're moving around. Well, I um, don't understand how they ever come up with quick. That's over my head. Well, some of the some of the time when you have these kind of odd translations in the King James, you find out that this gets more complicated than we need to get. But you know that everything in Scripture is a translation from a different language. Okay, mm -hmm. so Jesus very likely did not speak even Koine Greek. He may have had some Greek. Um, because he would have had to interact in some places where Greek was spoken. But by and large, Jesus would have spoken Aramaic. All right. So already the accounts of Jesus's ministry were translated from Aramaic into, um, into Greek, which is why you get that word play from a couple weeks ago where Peter is called the rock upon which the church will be built. Well, Peter means if Peter is Petros, means rock, and so does rock, and then you get the stumbling block later, which also means rock. And so it's all like, in Aramaic, all three of those words would be kephas. In Greek, they're all three different words. So it, it gets complicated. When the King James Version was written in the 1600s, it used as its primary source the Latin Vulgate which was a translation that a guy named Jerome did way, way, way back, like in the I think, 300s, 400s. Um, and it had some issues. Um, Jerome was a Hebrew scholar, but he didn't always have a good grasp of Hebrew. And so there are some places where he caused more problems than we really wish he had. Um, nowadays, the translations that we have, like the one we use in church, is the NRSV, which looks at what the Vulgate has to say, but goes back as far as possible with the original text that we still have. Um, you know, we don't have, there's nowhere existing a, a, an original Bible from Jesus' day. There's just not. Um, most of our manuscripts don't come until 100, 200 years after he died. So it's, you know, 
this is textual criticism stuff and it's it's deep it gets boring quick too um so yeah um a lot of times when you get one of those you may have had a weird translation in the latin vulgate from jerome and they picked it up and tried to translate it into english and quick was better than living i you know i have a somewhat more simplistic um when uh, you first feel the baby move, that's the quickening. Yeah. So when you're living, you're the quick. Yeah. So. Um, okay. So the next one. You notice that in the new translation, we dropped descended into hell and replaced it with descended into the dead. However, there is a footnote that says some traditions say descended into the dead or into hell. The reason we stop with that is because the word that they used in Greek when they wrote this creed is a very strange word. Um, the word is katotata, and it only appears twice in the Bible and never in the section of the Bible that was originally written in Greek. It only appears in the Greek version of the Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint. And so it is a translation of a Hebrew word that has no, no actual relationship to the Greek word that they use to translate it, which means that they didn't know what the Hebrew word was. So they just went with the Greek word that they thought was right. So um, what it literally should say is he descended into the depths of the earth. So he descended to the dead. You know, when you die, what happens to you? You get buried in the depths of the earth, okay? So it's not meant to signify that Jesus went down to hell. It was supposed to be that Jesus died and, you know, he was literally dead. So they put his body in a tomb and he was in the depths of the earth. It's supposed to signify the fact that he was actually dead. What is it, Linda? Aren't the tombs above ground? They are the That's what I was thinking. The entrance is above ground, but it slopes down inside. So he's I mean that's that's the idea of it. The tombs were in the caves that sloped down. So it's not like a straight up hole. So everybody had to find a cave that sloped down? No, you made the cave. Slope down. Yeah. So tombs were tombs weren't just random. At, at this point in 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 Jewish history, tombs wouldn't have been just random caves that they found in places. They would be hewn out of rock to a certain specification. So if you remember in, is it the Lucan account? It's probably, yeah, it's probably Luke, about how this was a newly made tomb that Jesus was laid in. So it was, it was a tomb of a rich guy who was a like borderline disciple of Jesus. So that's, that's why they made the change. And, and like I said, people got upset about this change. Um, you know, the place that I did internship at, they passed a council resolution to say that they would only use the LBW translation of the Apostles Creed and the Nicene Creed. And when we updated the bulletin and I wasn't paying close enough attention and we accidentally used the Apostles Creed from the ELW, they called me out on it in council and were like very upset. They said, that's not the original. And so the next day I went to the council president with a copy of the original text in Greek and said, if you want to use the original, here you go. Read this. So. In Greek. Is that when they fired you? Do I? Is that, that when they fired you? <laughs> no, no, they didn't fire me. They liked me. They wanted me back. <laughs> They're a lot, though. Why do people want to believe that Jesus descended into hell? Because it create. there's this whole sub-Christian tradition of Jesus going down, and it comes from the idea of him conquering death which literally means that Jesus was raised by God, and so death was swallowed up. But they hear, these groups hear conquering death, and so they picture this great cosmic battle 
where Jesus goes down to hell and beats Satan up for a little while and, and then breaks out of hell and comes back on the third day and, and is victorious out of death. But I mean, that, that's wrong for several reasons. One, of course, we know from Revelation that the final battle between good and evil doesn't come until the end. Okay? There would be no point in having a pre-skirmish. Okay? Second, yes, Jesus does break the bonds of death, but Jesus isn't the one who does it himself. That's why we translate it, he was raised from the dead. It's past, it's, it's not past tense, it's passive. Yes, passive. Thank you, Bonnie. So it's passive. <laughs> it means there's action outside of you. So God raised Jesus from the dead. It was God's divine action that raised him, not he just popped up out of the tomb and was like, hey, I'm back. You know, that's, that's not how it went. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So all of this, so we, we've covered all of the translation issues. So what does this particular article mean for us in the grand scheme of things? Um, we cover Born of the Virgin Mary. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that one. Don't, don't worry. It's, it's coming. Well, but you made that statement. I know, but it's, <laughs> we ain't there yet. We're about to be, <laughs> unless you keep asking me about it. <laughs> well, you said we covered it all. I said we covered those translation issues. Okay. So. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> Did I play back the recording? <laughs> I'm going to start muting people. <laughs> so what does it mean for us? Is what I was trying to say. Um, this is first and foremost a summation of who Jesus is and what he has done as far as our Christian understanding goes. Okay? So when you look back at the, the second article, it tells you that Jesus is God's only son that Jesus is our Lord, and as Lord is the master of all of us, that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, so he was not born of natural means as far as conception, but he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born from Mary. He suffered under a minor Roman official named Pontius Pilate who was trying to score points and get back to Rome, okay? Side note there, the Gospels do a really weird job of trying to let the Romans off in this matter. They put a lot of the blame on the Jewish hierarchy, especially the high priest and the Sanhedrin. Yes, they are the ones who bring the initial charges, but if you look back at the history of it, if Rome or if the Roman governor did not agree with the charges, they would not have been brought and there would have been no death penalty. The Sanhedrin could throw a fit all they wanted. It wouldn't matter. They, they weren't in charge. The Romans were. So despite the fact that the Gospels try to let the Romans off, the reality is Jesus was executed with the sign above his head that said, here is the king of the Jews. He was executed as somebody who was a political threat to Rome. So... Side note. Yeah, but didn't, I mean, didn't Pilate try to wash his hands of that? So Pilate washes his hands of that in the, in the scripture text, right? But it wouldn't have mattered. At the end of the day, if Pilate had said, no, this isn't right, you're not doing this, that's, that would have stopped it. And he was well within his authority to do that and did it often based on the records that we have from his administration. What about the tradition of letting someone go? So there is that tradition of letting someone go, which they did, Barabbas, which was unhelpful for everybody. <laughs> Except Barabbas. Well, yeah, but he probably ended up right back, you know, career criminal. He was a habitual crook. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified. He was died. He was buried. He descended to the dead. He rose again on the third day. Then he ascended into heaven. This is getting into what we know from Acts. 
He is seated at the right hand of God, the Almighty Father, from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. So this is a clear summation of what we know about Jesus and what we confess about Jesus as Christians. Okay. Because if you don't confess these things about Jesus as Christians, then you're not Christian. Because you kind of have to accept who Christ is and what Christ did in order to call yourselves Christians. Otherwise, you're either still Jewish or nowadays something else that I don't even want to get into. So, okay. Which brings us to the debate around the virginity of Mary. The reason there's a translation issue there is not necessarily because Mary wasn't a virgin. Okay, this is that's a very old tradition. Okay, so there's a good chance that it was based in something real. But the reason that it was originally included was because they were taking a prophecy from Isaiah. Okay, and in the Isaiah text, they mistranslated the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word was not the word for virgin. It was the word for young girl. So, whether she was a virgin or whether she wasn't, the point of the whole thing has always been to point out that Jesus was born purely without sin and of supernatural means through the conception of the Holy Spirit. Um, you can debate till the cows come home about whether you should retain the idea of the virgin birth. I personally think you should, but not because of basing it in the mistranslation of Isaiah. I think you should because it's an old tradition. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. What does not make sense and what I push back strongly against is the idea that Mary remained a virgin for the rest of her life, even after having had Jesus. One, physically impossible. Two, um, we know that she had other children based on the Gospels and the Book of Acts. The way certain of our Catholic brothers and sisters have attempted to get around that is by saying, that those were stepchildren of Joseph and they've invented this whole tradition that Joseph was older and had had a wife before and had this whole head of youngins that was just following him around. And there's no scriptural support for that, that you're, you're trying to go around and around to make your point when the reality is in front of you that Mary had other children. So there's no point getting hung up on the perpetual virginity of Mary. Okay. It just, it's not a thing. Um, well, I told you I'm learning a lot. That's the first time I knew that there was a theory that she remained a virgin. Yes. And never crossed my mind. Yes. It is a doctrine in the Catholic church. I just didn't know that. And right. I have a it's, really good Catholic friend and I sure didn't know that. I'm going to talk to her about that. It's in the Catholic <laughs> catechism. You, that's one of the things you have to confess as a Catholic is that she was a perpetual virgin which is why she's the blessed virgin even now. So, yes, and they even still pray to the virgin man. Well, so the idea like we Some we, of them do, I assure you. Yeah, right. But what Lexi. So the the prayer you're talking about is the Hail Mary, the Ave Maria. Okay? And there was a version of the Hail Mary prior to the Reformation that is different than the version there is now. Okay. The idea of praying, it's not praying to Mary. The idea was that Mary is a blessed saint in heaven and so intercedes for us on behalf of humanity to God. It's the same idea that we actually have about Jesus that when we close our prayers in the name of Jesus, that Jesus then intercedes for us on our behalf to God. So the idea is not so much praying to Mary as somebody who can grant prayers, but basically asking Mary as a blessed saint to help us make our prayers heard to God. Is it still theologically shaky? Yes. Okay. But it's not quite the same thing as, as deification. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, it does. Yes. I think there's there's more evidence that Mary was a virgin than that she was not. Yeah. And like I said, it's a very old tradition. So I I don't I don't like tearing apart old traditions based on one mistranslation. Okay. Is the Isaiah passage mistranslated? Definitely. Okay. The the Hebrew word has nothing to do with virginity. It just doesn't. You know, but that's not the first time that we as Christians have taken things out of context. Okay, especially in Isaiah. You know, we talk about the suffering servant passage in Isaiah being a a prediction of Jesus when Isaiah makes it quite clear at the beginning of that section that he's talking about Israel as the suffering servant, not somebody who's coming later. So, you know. I think that's more an example of Christians trying to go back and find proof text to fit what we want to say. That's not to say that I don't think Mary was a virgin. I think there is an important concept there in the idea of Jesus being born into the world without sin because Jesus was sinless and so was not tainted in any way. Does that make sense? Okay. So, Having talked about all of that, um, what has Jesus done in his role as the, the son of God who has come down to the world and redeemed us? Okay, He's redeemed us and he's released us from our sin, from the devil, from death, and from all temporal misfortune. Okay, Yes, bad things are going to happen, but they're only happening in this life. And so when this life is over, we gain eternal glory through our belief in Jesus. Okay. Um, basically the idea is that we broke the relationship with God eons ago. Okay. And so Jesus came to repair that relationship. Now Luther would say that there was no help for humanity at all, that we were, and he gets really close to John Calvin on this, that, that we are, um, irredeemable and that we are um, absolutely evil. Um, and I tend to not want to go that far. I think Luther got carried away sometimes with his own issues and they showed up in his writings. Um, yes, we broke the relationship with God. But there are numerous examples of God coming back to humanity throughout the Old Testament, even before Jesus is born, and finding ways to lift up righteous people, to lead the people forth, to renew the covenant with the people. And I think if we say that if it wasn't for Jesus coming, we would have no access to God, I think we ignore all of our past that is represented in the Hebrew Bible. You know, we can't. We can't ignore the role that Jesus played because Jesus did save us from eternal death and f allowed us to be in right relationship with God without having to fulfill all the aspects of the law. But to say that if it hadn't been for Jesus coming, we would have no relationship at all with God ignores everything that happened before the Gospel of Matthew starts. And that is a problem within Christianity. We like to look at the gospel more than we look at anything else because it's where our part starts and we like our part. But the reality is there is 4,000 years of God's relationship with people prior to that, that we can't ignore because we're a part of that relationship. We've been adopted into that covenant through Jesus. So there's my Old Testament soapbox for you. Okay, so what questions do you have about the second article? If you look at Luther's explanation of it, um, what does this mean? It means, I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, born of the Father in eternity, and also a true human being. That's important. Um, 
born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned human. He has purchased and freed me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. He's done all this in order that I may belong to him, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in eternal righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. So the reason I said that one part was important. One of the earliest heresies in the church was to say that Jesus was either fully human or fully divine, but not both. Because people wanted to argue that he could only either be a human or God. He couldn't do both. The church confesses that Jesus is at the same time 100% human and 100% God. We don't know how that works. We don't know how that math works out. We just know that that's what the reality is. And so it's one of those things that has to be accepted completely on faith because there's no rational way to explain it because it's a divine action. You know, and if you could explain everything that God did, there'd be no need for God. Does that make sense? Yeah. look at the book real quick because there were some questions in here that I liked. Doo, 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 doo. So Jesus suffered, died, and was raised again. What does that say to you when you are suffering? That it's only temporary. Yeah. And it's going to get better in, in my eternal life. It'll go away. I mean, it's hard in the midst of suffering to have a clear enough mind to say, you know, that even when you're suffering, it's hard to say, yeah, this is going to get better because your mind is occupied by the suffering. Um, you know, you have that hope, but it's not always as strong as you would like it to be. Um, I think it's even harder to have enough introspection to say, you know, well, if I'm going through this, isn't it amazing that Jesus was willing to give himself up and experience suffering when he didn't have to? All for me, you know. And that's more of a thought that you have once the suffering's over and you have time to reflect and you're not in the middle of it. But it's a, I mean, it's an impactful thought. You know, when you think about the fact that, that God, God's self came down to earth in the person of Jesus and allowed us to nail him to a cross and suffer pain and suffer agony and everything else and humiliation at the hands of the creation that he made and die and then be raised. I mean, that's, and then on top of that, you know, I, it's, it's one of those things that's always bugged me just a little bit because at the end, when Jesus is raised, this is the opportunity for him to like walk into the Sanhedrin and be like, I'm back. <laughs> Guess you didn't get me, did you? But he doesn't do that. You know, it would have made things a lot easier for us if he had, you know, if he just walked up and popped Pontius Pilate in the face. But that's just not the way the story ends. You know, the story ends with us being responsible for carrying that message forward because Jesus ascends into heaven. You know, I, I think the whole thing is remarkable. You know, and it clearly demonstrates exactly what we were promised in the first petition the first article that God is the creator of the world and cares intimately for each of us. Else, why would Jesus have come? I think like the word love, that the word suffering um, is used too liberally now. That when people talk about suffering, they're not really suffering. Yeah. 
I mean, when I have to listen to people on Facebook with their political complaints and they're not wanting to wear masks, I mean, that's suffering. I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's eternal suffering. Having to read about it is suffering. (laughs) Okay. So let's, yes. Some people have a very low tolerance for discomfort. Yeah. They're. You could just say some people whine. They're whiners. (laughs) They're complainers over practically nothing. Yeah, nurses can tell you that. Nurses will know will tell you that there are patients that that grin and parrot, and there are patients that accept things, and then there are patients that whine every fifteen seconds that they'd really like to cover their face with a pillow. But you know, <laughs> the hospital gets upset at that kind of thing, and there's an inquiry. So. Well, I must have been an unusual patient when I had my terrible accident. But many times I was I was told I was complimented on my attitude and that I was a, a miracle. And I don't remember do I, I don't think I did anything special. I just made up my mind I was going to get better for my family. But it was obvious that a lot of their patients gave them a hard time. And I, I was there to get better. I was there to do whatever they told me to do. And, and I remember a lot of comments that I got that were complimentary in the circumstances, but I think they were genuine. I had a lady put me in the shower. I had not had a bath in seven weeks, and it may have been eight weeks. And she asked me what I wanted, and I said, I want to get in that shower. And she said, I will put you in there. Well, I had an occupational therapist, and that was the lady that should have done it, but this lady did it anyway. She put on a rain suit, and she got in the shower with me because I had been cooperative with her. If I had not been, I'd have never had that shower at that time. Yeah. I'll guarantee you it was the best shower I ever had in my life. <laughs> I got it from head to toe, hair and everything. It was wonderful. So. I, I think you should believe them, Barbara. You are a remarkable woman. I don't yeah. know about that. I'm, I don't feel real <laughs> remarkable anymore. I'm beginning That's, to feel this we'll, we'll vote on it. Everybody who thinks Barbara is remarkable, say yes. Um, yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. Opposed, leave the group. Yeah, motion <laughs> All right, so we're getting it's seven forty-one. So let's move on to the third article. All right, so again, this is, huh? I thought we were going to do it next week. No. Go ahead. We're trying to get back on track. And I thought you had plenty of time. Nope. So, all right. Third article, and again, this is the old translation out of the SBH. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Um, So, the new translation. And by the way, Having translated this, because I actually have the Greek text on in frames in my office at Christ Community, because I'm weird like that. Um, it's it, the new translation is a better translation. Um, okay, so get out of there. All right, so the third article in the new translation. I believe in the Holy Spirit. We've talked about the difference between ghost and spirit. The Holy Catholic Church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So, in the Greek, the Catholic Church part is there. It's Catholic. Um, But, do you think it means the Catholic Church as in the Roman Catholic Church? No. No. Okay. 
good. So Catholic in this case, small c, not big C. Small c means universal, um, which is why the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, when they had to brand themselves after the Protestant Reformation, chose that name because they wanted to imply that they were the true universal church and everybody else was heretics. Um, you know, and even though they're nice to us now, they still think we're heretics. So, you know, there's that. What were they called before? They were just called the church. They didn't have an official name. And when did they take, when did they take the Catholic name? So they started being referred to as the, the Roman Catholic church um, after the Protestant Reformation because they needed a way to distinguish themselves from all the people that they thought were heretics, like the Lutherans and the Anabaptists and the Presbyterians, the Calvinists and the Church of England and, and the 500,000 other people who jumped up and were like, we don't like that. We're building our own church. Um, yeah. Of course, they had had a, a, an argument with the Greek Orthodox Church in... 1066, right around the time of the Battle of the Hast Battle of Hastings, um, it, which is called the Great Schism, and in that, that's when the because basically what was happening was the Pope in Rome, who was originally just the Bishop of Rome, was trying to claim authority over all of the different uh, archdioceses of the Church. Originally, there were seven cities around the Mediterranean that had archbishops, and those archbishops basically formed like a church council, okay? Nobody was above anybody. They were all the holy sees, so it was, if I, I don't know if I can remember them now, Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, I got five of them. That's close. Um, in any case, these were the ones who were in charge of the church. And so when they needed to make a decision, they came together. No one was above anybody else. However, the Roman Catholic Church or the, the Pope in Rome decided to start trying to exercise his authority over other sees because he could point to that passage that we had a few weeks ago in Matthew where Jesus said, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And then he could point to the tradition that Peter went to Rome and built a church and was martyred there. And so he could say that Peter was the first bishop of Rome, and thus everybody in that line was actually the one in charge of the church. The, uh, see, the Holy See in Constantinople, which was the capital of the Byzantine Empire, the old eastern half of the Roman Empire, he didn't like that very much. Um, plus, he had a fancier church in the Hagia Sophia. Um, and so he pushed back against that, and they had this big dispute, and they excommunicated each other and stopped talking for like a thousand years. So, yeah. Ain't Christianity great? <laughs> yeah, and this is why we made their C small. Yeah. <laughs> we shrunk their C. <laughs> um, that was of course, if you're, if you're familiar with with history, um, Constantinople fell in 1456 to the Ottoman Turks, who then created, who renamed it as Istanbul, and created a very large empire and converted the Hagia Sophia to a mosque. Um, when the Ottoman dynasty fell in the 1920s um, and they went secular. It was converted into a museum and recently has been converted back into a mosque um, along with another uh, former Christian cathedral. And where is that? This is in Turkey, Istanbul. Istanbul. Um, but just remember, you can't get too upset about that because we did the same thing as Christians to Muslims. Um, there was a whole civilization that was created in the southern part of Spain called Al-Andalus, and there are hundreds of mosques 
that when Francis, uh, not Francis, when uh, Isabella and Ferdinand kick the Muslims out of Spain right before the, the voyages of discovery when Christopher Columbus went sailing. Um, when they kicked them out, all those mosques were converted to Christian churches. So, you know, it, turnabout's fair play. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's a side note. Anyway. <clears throat> side note. Um, yeah. So we know it's small c, but in the old translations, because people didn't disassociate one from the other, they used Holy Christian Church. And a lot of uh, churches still actually use that translation. Like our brothers and sisters in the Missouri Synod still say Holy Christian Church. Um, and part of it is because there was a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment, especially early on in the United States during the colonial period and into the, the early Republic period, um, even into the 60s. I mean, if you remember when John F. Kennedy was elected, as the only Catholic president thus far, you know, people were legitimately concerned about whether he was going to be, you know, loyal to the country or loyal to the Pope, you know, and it was even worse back in the colonial period, you know, Catholics were essentially traitors because they were those Popist. Um, yeah. So that's why that's like that. So what does this article mean for us? Um, Essentially, the whole point of this is to is twofold. It's to acknowledge, one, that a Holy Spirit exists. Um, you will hear people say that Christianity invented the idea of the triune God, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But that doesn't bear out if you look at the Old Testament. Because you hear about the Spirit of God, the Ruach, which is the Hebrew word for it, of God. The Spirit of God moves over the waters all the way back at the beginning of creation, okay? You will hear about, you know, the divine Godhead in the Old Testament. You know, in the creation story, God doesn't say, let me, you know, alarm, or let me make light. God says, let us make light or let us make humanity. Let us make animals. Clearly, there's there's more going on there. Um I even had a professor who said, do you remember the story where Abraham and Sarah are camping out in the middle of nowhere and the three strangers roll up and um, tell them that Sarah will become pregnant? She bust out laughing inside the tent. I had a professor who, without biblical proof, but he was very adamant that he thought that was a, a demonstration of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in human form, walking the face of the earth and coming to Abraham. Um, so we didn't invent this. We just refined it and tried to understand it. We still don't understand it. Um, but so it, the first function of this is to remind us that there is a Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is important, even though Lutherans try to run away from the Holy Spirit as fast as we can because the Holy Spirit does things that we don't understand, okay? So what's the function of the Holy Spirit? It's exactly what it says in the article. It unites us into a community, into a holy Catholic church. You know, whether we have our differences or not, we are still one universal faith in that we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, and if you sit there and think that when you die, there's only going to be Lutherans in heaven, you're wrong. Okay. I doubt that God gives a crap about our denominational disputes. Okay. It's not like, it's not like we're going to get to heaven and God's going to be like, well, you know what? Those good works. Yeah. It turns out they were important. So you're going to have to go down there with brother Luther. He's hot right now. You know, I, it's, it's just not going to happen, y'all. There's going to be Catholics in heaven and Presbyterians and Baptists and, you know, probably even Pentecostals. I mean, that may be of a stretch, but they'll, they're probably going to be there. Just hopefully they won't sing. Um, yeah, so. Well, I feel like any Protestant, well, any religion that believes in the Trinity 
will wind up in heaven. Yep. Um, and we could, we could talk about that some more because honestly, Revelation says that, and in several other texts, including Paul, says the Jews will be saved. It doesn't say they will necessarily convert to our version of, of the faith, but they're God's people. They remain God's people, you know, and you can argue and say, well, they don't accept Jesus. And so they're not, they don't have the full revelation. Well, maybe not, but they're always been God's people and that covenant still stands. So, and honestly, I, I wonder about Muslims because they are descended from God's people too. And they do accept that the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of the, the God they worship. So I don't know. I'm not qualified to make that, that particular determination. I'll leave that to God. It's a lot easier. Um, yeah. Okay. So the Holy Spirit unites us and makes us holy in that it unites us into one universal church, one universal faith focused on Jesus and what God has done for us. Okay. It brings us into the communion of saints. Okay. So we're not by ourselves in this world, just trying to be little St. Michael at 321 Mess Main Street. Okay, we're surrounded by a whole cloud of hosts of all the people who have been and who have gone before us, who have, you know, been a part of that community or any community. And, and that's where the idea of the, the Hail Mary comes from, because you're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Okay. Um, my friends in the Missouri Senate refer to it as the church triumphant and the church militant. Okay, so we're still alive. We're in the church militant because we're still down here fighting the battles like the military. Okay, when you die, you rise to the church triumphant and because you've finally conquered death. And so you are with the communion of saints and you are just as intimately involved in the lives of others as God is because you're all one in faith. Um, that in particular... You know, I, I struggle with the idea of someone who's died, like, looking down on you and stuff. Um, it, one, it's a little creepy. But two, it just, you know, it just, <laughs> it is. Um, but, you know, I do feel reassured from that, that idea that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses and that, you know, it's not just us here. There is untold numbers of people who have gone before us to be with God that are with us in in spirit you know it's we have a whole little army going on um so the holy spirit also provides for the forgiveness of sins because the forgiveness of sins comes through the administration of the sacraments and so the holy spirit is present when we have holy communion the holy spirit is present when we have holy baptism the holy spirit is present when we have worship and when we do confession and forgiveness, and when we're gathered together, even here, and while we have a more muted understanding of the Holy Spirit's actions, you know, we, we acknowledge that the Holy Spirit points us out and sends us places, um, you know, there's something to be said for what some of our charismatic brothers and sisters receive from the Holy Spirit, you know, that excitement they get and that fervor and, you know, the the excitement they bring to their worship and praise and stuff, you know, it, it wouldn't be a totally bad thing for us to get some of that, you know, it would probably scare people, but it wouldn't be a bad thing. It would not scare us. We've had it happen in a service. before. Yeah. Yeah. I heard about it. Um, so, okay. Last two things, the Holy spirit brings about the resurrection of the body um, and the life everlasting, because by working on you, your whole life, from the time you're baptized through, you know, all the times you take communion and into the end of your life, the Holy Spirit is constantly working in your heart to try and move you to a better place, to be in a better person, 
and to getting you to that goal of the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, because that that's where we end up, right? You know, it's not like it, the Holy Spirit's not trying to like get you prepared for a test. It's getting you prepared for the fact that you will be resurrected from the dead and that you will achieve life everlasting. And then you'll understand the Holy Spirit a whole lot more. Well, I have, I have felt that God is with me at all times in the form of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And that's what Jesus says, you know, when Jesus is with the, well, at that point, it's the 11 in the closed room and he breathes the Holy Spirit on them, you know, it's his presence to be with them always. Mm -hmm. um, so Luther's explanation of this, what does this mean? I believe that I cannot by my own understanding or effort believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. This is typical Luther. You can't, you can't change from your fallen ways. You, at the end of the day, you don't want to, because it's a lot more fun to go sin. You know, it's a lot more fun to not worry about things and just do whatever you want and call people whatever you want, unless they're bigger than you, then it gets less fun. Um, but so Jesus, we cannot come to Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him but the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and kept me in true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it united with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, day after day, he fully forgives my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give me and all believers in Christ eternal life. This is most certainly true. So, what does it mean that God chooses us and adopts us as children without relying on us to ask for it to be done? Just like our children don't ask to be brought into this world or to be loved, we do it anyway. I mean, we've talked a little bit about this before. Um, I struggle very much with the the aspect of Christian, of not Lutheran, but other Christian denominations and their theology that you have to accept the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart that you have to ask him to be your personal Lord and Savior, okay? The reality is that according to Scripture, that's not how it works. It's not a matter about you going, okay, God, you know, yes, you created the world, but, you know, I'm going to go ahead and open the door and let you in now, okay? You know, I know you were waiting for my permission, so here it is, okay? The reality is God has sought us out and marked us all. Okay? It's not something that we had to do. It's something that God did. God was the primary actor in all of this. You know? And so it's very important that we don't have to make this choice on our own, that God has chosen us. Because if we did, we wouldn't make the choice. We'd just keep going on with our sinful life and doing whatever we wanted to do. So it's a good thing that we don't have to be the ones who make the choice. Now, can you run away? Yeah. You know, you can be raised in the, the church. You can be baptized and you can hit confirmation age and treat it like Lutheran graduation and haul tail and never come back to church. Okay. We've all seen plenty of people do that. Um, but does it change the fact that you have been called by God and that God is working on your heart in some way or form? I don't think so. God's still there. You can't evict him quite that easily. What are y'all's thoughts? Well, I guess that gives truth to the fact that God 
meet you where you are here. It's nothing that, it, it doesn't work in reverse. <laughs> I mean, it's just like we talked about this. Well, for those of you who were able to hear the sermon this past Sunday, um, you know, we owe a debt to God for, for not only for creation, but also for salvation. It's a debt that can't be satisfied by anything that we can do. You know, you can't pay that back. There's nothing you can do that's going to merit that. You know, are there things you should do to, to express the fact that you have reached that? Yes, but you're not going to earn it. So, you know, it's a good thing that it's freely given. It's a good thing that God does accept us for who we are and then helps move us to where God needs us to be. Because if we had to do it on our own, we just continue screwing up over and over again and end up in the same place. And this is where some of the other religions differ because they believe that it's a choice. Yeah. And then within the Lutheran church, it's already been done for you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's nothing that you have to do. And saint and sinner at the same time, yeah, true. You die to the cross every single day. I mean, I think the, the one thing that we as Lutherans have to be cautious about is that the way we tell people about that kind of thing doesn't sound like we just think we have a get out of jail free card. Um, and that's the way it's been taught in some cases, that, that because God has already forgiven us and that Jesus has made us righteous, that we can essentially go do whatever we want and sin boldly and sin often and, and just be awful people. And then at the end go, Jesus, please forgive me. And we're in, you know, and I think one that ignores the, the numerous times in scripture where it says, and in the creed where it says, Jesus will judge the living and the dead. Okay. There's, there's going to be some conversation at the end. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but there's going to be conversation. You know, we have to be aware of the fact that we're not set free to just go do whatever we want. We're set free from the worry of what happens when we mess up, okay? Because we know we're going to mess up. We're imperfect. We're always going to screw up. But we don't have to worry that our honest mistakes are going to doom us to hell because God has saved us through Jesus, so instead of worrying about that, we can focus on how we constantly work to get better, to be different people, to be better people in the world, and to show people what it means to be Christian, you know? And it does require more than that stupid little fish sticker on the back of your car. Yeah, one of them stupid little fish stickers almost drowned me this afternoon I, with the mud puddle. <laughs> It's always the people with those stickers. Like There should be a state law that says if they're on those people's cars, they should have their licenses revoked. <laughs> so. All right. Any questions about what we've talked about here? Anything that I made less clear than it was when you came in? Something we didn't actually talk about, but it's always uh, concerned me, or I have questions about, and th and that is that this whole thing on in Luther's explanation on the last day will be raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. What happens from the day I die till the last day? You want the short answer? Or the long answer? Well, I'd rather have the long answer, actually. <laughs> okay, so there are a variety of theories, but no real certainty. So Luther subscribed to an idea called soul sleep, in which when you die, yeah, I mean, we, we as Christians believe that your soul doesn't go floating off in the outer space or anything like that, okay? You stay united with your body. You are 
because your body is going to be renewed with you. Um, I, I've always wondered how that's going to work out for the people who are cremated and spread mm -hmm. different places. I imagine that's going to take a little bit more time than just climb out of the ground, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so when you, since we subscribe to that particular view of, of death, that the soul stays with the body, then Luther says that there is something called soul sleep, where essentially your soul just slips out of time and into the care of Christ. And so you essentially have no idea that any time is passing because you've slipped out of time and basically you're going to die. And as soon as you die, boom, you've made it to the end of time because you're suddenly going to be awakened. And that's, that's it. That's the judgment day. Okay. Um, Paul, the, Luther's theory is based on what Paul says in Romans. And Paul essentially says that, the dead are with Christ. Actually, we, we read that passage last Sunday. Um, whether we die in Christ or live in Christ, we are with Christ in, in all things. Um, so for Paul, no matter what, you could not be separated from Christ. You could not be separated from God's presence. So somehow or in some way, even when you die, you are still connected to God. Um, the Catholic Church would say you go to purgatory. Um, they don't talk about that very much now because they realize that people don't quite like that idea. And it's based on apocryphal books that we don't talk about normally. But, you know, basically purgatory is this place where you go to expiate some sins and that's where the indulgences came in. It gets very complicated. Um, unfortunately, I can't tell you for sure because none of us know for sure. I personally am down with Luther's idea of soul sleep. I, I would like it to be, I die and then boom, there it is. End of days, everybody's back. We're all reunited and we just get this thing over with. You know, I, I would be very, very depressed to find out that I just have to hang out in a grave for like another million years <laughs> before the end of the age actually happens. That would be sad. I would be upset. What about absent from the body, present with the Lord? That sounds about like what I was taught growing up. The yeah, body yeah. dies, but the soul moves on. Yes, and that is based not actually in Christianity so much as in Greek philosophy. In Greek philosophy, the soul is separate from the body, the suke, um, and the soul is free to move around. And it's actually a bit of Gnosticism too. Um, Gnosticism was a uh, early church heresy that assumed that they had secret knowledge um, and you get a bunch of Gnostic gospels like the, the gospel of Thomas. Um, but basically they assumed that everything on earth was evil and that your soul was trying desperately to escape from this evil plane and ascend to the divine plane in which things were good. Um, but we have since as a as a united faith push back against that at the council of chalcedon may have to become gnostic i mean at the end of the day you're pretty much free to believe whatever you want um you know because nobody knows and it won't affect what you believe it's still going to happen yeah pretty much um, I, but this is the, my personal preference for soul sleep is why I have, if you hear when I preach sermons for funerals, you're never going to hear me say the words, the person is looking down on us and, and will protect us and care for us. I, you're never going to hear me say that. Okay. You'll hear me say that the person is with our Lord Jesus Christ that they are surely in God's presence because the Bible reassures me of that. You know, Paul tells me that's what's going to happen in some way or form. I don't know what it is, but that's the way it's going to happen. But I'm not going to sit up there and say, you know, grandpa is smiling down on us and is going to watch over us as our guardian angel because it's just not theologically correct. You know, I, and 
maybe it's okay to make people feel a little bit better to say that, but I don't know that that really does. You know, like in my case, I had people tell me when my dad died that he was smiling down on me. Well, let me tell you something. There's things that I do on a daily basis that I don't want him involved in. Okay. I, it's just a creepy idea to me. You know? No, I get that. But also when we go through Lent from ashes, you came and from ashes, you yep. will return. Yeah. So that's what I'm having a, that's the rub with the soul sleep thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, the idea of ash to ashes, dust to dust is not, not that, you know, your body won't decompose or anything like that. It's that that's exactly what will happen. Your body will decompose. It will return to the earth as God designed it to do, but that at the resurrection, it will be renewed and you'll be back in it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that step was uh, not spoken to me. I didn't catch that step in the short class. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Do we get to choose? A, Do we get to choose which body? Yeah, I had no idea. I, I would like the younger one, please. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, again, this this comes from Paul's theology, and Paul is insistent that there's a bodily resurrection and that that belief is based in the fact that Jesus was bodily resurrected and he came back in the same body complete with the wounds, you know? What other questions? It sure gets complicated. Well, theology does. And, and, Honestly, it's because we spend a lot of time trying to figure it out and coming up with different ideas. And, and nobody ever completely agrees on those ideas and we argue back and forth and then start 500,000 churches. So you, you believe in the soul sleep? That's what I would like to think happens, yes. Well, would you re restate that? So soul sleep is that when you die, you essentially go into a sleep state in which you are removed from time you are with christ but you have no idea that time is passing because it seems like i guess the best example would be you know how sometimes at night you lay down and you go to sleep and it feels like as soon as you close your eyes the alarm clock is going off yeah you have no recollection of the time passing that's that's to me that's what soul sleep comes down to you are in the presence of Christ. Christ is protecting you, and you don't know time's passing. So it's essentially like you die, and then as soon as you die, boom, here's the judgment day. You're there. So during this time when you are with Christ, you don't know you're with Christ? You don't know you're with Christ because there's no time passing for you. So there's essentially there's no time there for you to acknowledge anything. Christ becomes your protector, whether you know it or not. Okay, yeah, that goes back to the temporal thing. A, a, a minute with God is like a thousand years. Yeah, Cairo's time versus Chronos time. Well, I'm sort of like, well, whatever happens, happens. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing I'll, you can do about it. I'll be there at the end. <laughs> yeah. One day we're all going to get there, so. We all have that hope. <laughs> right. Thank you for that long explanation. It it did help. Okay, I'm glad. It only confused me, but you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and see, this is why this is why this is the kind of thing that's better for a Bible study, where we have an hour to talk about things you know, and, and some time to, to kind of process things rather than a 12 minute sermon in which, you know, if I hit you with that and then got out of the pulpit, everybody in the congregation be like, what did he just say? It was soul sleep. You know? Well, unfortunately the Bible says a lot about death without really saying anything. Well, and 
remember that mm -hmm. the Bible is written divinely inspired, surely, but written through human hands. So, you know, it's essentially us divinely inspired and in making what engineers would call a wag, which is a wild A guess. <laughs> um, that's what a lot of theology is. You know? And it, that's also why I read commentaries before I do sermons, because I'll read a Bible passage and sometimes something will jump out to me. Okay, something will seem like a really good idea. If I go read a couple commentaries and nobody says anything about that, then I get a little nervous because if I've come up with an interpretation that nobody mm -hmm. else has in 2000 years, good chance that I probably don't need to go with that. You know, I'm not that smart and mm -hmm. somebody would have thought of it before me. You don't want to plow new ground. Well, I don't want to lead anybody into eternal damnation. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for that. <laughs> that I understand. Well, so I mean, Barbara, Barbara keeps talking about those broad shoulders, and the reality <laughs> is that is one of the concerns that you have as pastor is like, don't send them to hell. <laughs> First, do no harm. <laughs> so was Luther the one who came up with this concept of soul sleep? No, Luther stole this from somebody else. Luther stole a lot of things from other people. Um, Are they Gnostic? Oh, well, no, a lot of Luther's a lot of Luther's theology was originally laid out by a guy named Jan Hus, who was about a hundred years before Luther, um, and was in Bohemia and made some noise and called out the Catholic Church and got burned at the stake for it. Mm. Uh, which is why there were several Bohemian wars, because his followers thought he had been wrongly executed, and he had been, but he picked the wrong time and didn't have the right protectors. Um, so you'll see sometimes a picture of um, a swan with Martin Luther. And the significance behind that is, is when Jan Hus was executed, his words were, his last words were purported to be, you may roast this goose, but a swan will arise from the flames. And so they would put a picture of a swan with Luther and say he was the swan that arose from the flames because he managed to get the ideas out and be successful. Luther rose from the flames. No, he didn't literally rise from the flames, but No, I realize that, but that's the symbol meaning that he that he did. Yeah, that he's the, the theological successor to Jan Hus and that okay. carried on the ideas. Yeah, if you ever hear of a church called the Bohemian Brethren, we're actually very close in theology to them. They may actually be a part of the Lutheran World for, uh, Federation now. I'm not sure. So. I, would really, I would really be interested in the Bible passages that soul sleep is based on. I'd have to look. Um, and like I said, I, I think a lot of it's going to be based on Paul's assertion that nothing can separate you from Christ. And so Luther and others just tried to make the best of that. But I'll look. Mm. All right. Any other questions, thoughts, concerns, smart remarks? You're 22 minutes late. <laughs> Not. I'm going to add that 22 minutes to my vacation. <laughs> well, I think it's a sign of our enjoyment that we run over. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. I thought you were going to say you were going to add it to your sermon, so I guess that's better you add it to your vacation. No. I've sat through a, I've sat through a 30 minute sermon before. When I was on an internship, they asked, we had a retired pastor in the congregation, and they asked him to preach because it wasn't my, I had already preached two Sundays in a row and our senior was gone. So he said yes. And he got up in the pulpit and he didn't have any papers with him. And he went and he went and he went and he went. And I don't, I like eventually I just got to the point. I didn't even know what he was talking about. He was just talking. And it's like, you know, this is why the shepherd staff was invented to just yank him out of there. Um, 
<laughs> Matter well, of fact, the average I, attention span for a sermon is about 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, matter of fact, my, my teaching parish, Pisgah Lexington, has a constitutional provision that a visiting pastor cannot exceed 15 minutes in the pulpit. Ooh. I, I don't know what would happen. Like, I don't know if Mr. Hugh is in the back with a stopwatch. And like, if you hit 1501, he hits you with a water gun or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, you know, that would be great. It, it was never enforced while I was there, but... <laughs> It was in the Constitution, so. But you didn't test it. No, no. <laughs> All right, well, why don't we end with a word of prayer? The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. you. And also Almighty, with you. Almighty God, we thank you for opening your word to us this evening, for helping us to learn a little bit more about who you are, even if it raises more questions for us in other places. Help our faith to be a curious faith, a faith not afraid of questioning, because it is through questioning that we find strength and we find new understanding and we grow closer to you. We pray that you would continue to help us on this journey, whether we were at the beginning or wherever we are at in our journey with you in our faith. We, help, we ask you to help us share this faith with those around us, with those who have not come to know you, and with those who may have known you, but may have gotten chased off or been hurt. We ask that you allow us to be your light in the world and your presence for all people. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Yep. Good night, everyone. Good night. Y'all have Good night. Miss <laughs> Barbara, yeah, I'm still okay. I'm still bringing mac and cheese, right? It didn't change. I'm just nope. double checking. No, well, I'm planning on your mac and cheese. No, John, <laughs> it changed. Now you have to bring filet mignon. <laughs> well, that's a big negative. I just wanted to make sure because I told her if you needed to change it, just let me know. And we're at no. Wednesday. No, no, I'm not changing it. I am, I am making a an extra container of a corn dish that I make that's easy to do and some um, candied yams just to make sure there is enough. Barbara, Other, would, like, would like a beef stew or something be helpful? Be great, be great. Okay. But now what are we gonna put it in, I'm, seriously? I mean, we can put it in, I, I can get some like disposable containers or something, it's not a big deal. Uh. I think I'll have one deep one. I bought some extras to use, and I think I've got one deep one I'm not going to use, and I will bring it in case you... Well, I don't know. You probably want to take it out of your crock pot at home. Yeah. Yeah. I'll yeah. look. I, I will, I've probably got to get over to Target at some point, and they've got a good collection of the disposable stuff, so I'll look. Have you been to the Berkeley Paper Place? The what? Berkeley paper. When I you go to down 17A from, from, from your house and you pass the John Deere tractor place, mm -hmm. just before that is a blue like warehouse looking building and it's the Berkeley paper. That's why we where we buy a, bu a bunch of our paper products. In the back of that, they have a very good selection of aluminum to go containers. Okay. I'll take a look at that. Uh, and it's at the back of the store, but anyone, in, and there's hardly anyone in there. I'll go in there, but where I wouldn't go into Target. Yeah. But uh, I went in there and bought several. I think they were $1.35 with the lid, I think. I'm not sure. It was pretty much when you think about it, but it's the only way I know to go is what we're doing. Yeah. But I'll have any ones I've got, I'll have with me in case somebody needs them. We've got we've got a great big group too from when we went to BJ's. I bought a big bag of them. I can just leave some at the church in case, you know, just in case. I mean, I'm gonna make this the night before. They'll just have to eat it up. Right, mine's not gonna be hot either, but uh, I'm not gonna try to carry anything hot, number one. 
I'm going um, I'm going to do the I'll do the ham on what? Well, I was cuz <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> um, oh, one, thing, get, get an idea. one thing before y'all get off here um i i had mentioned to a couple of you before about possibly doing a fall festival kind of thing over at christ community yeah um, on december 31st or not december 31st october 31st <laughs> yeah that would be that would be a winter festival um <laughs> Yeah, so we talked about that in the vision team meeting last night, and they want to do that. So they're planning for October 31st from 3 in the afternoon to 5. Um, they'll do a trunk retreat and, and make sure it's all spaced out. And I'm going to try to find those little, like, extendable buckets so we can just, like, dump it in the kids thing without <laughs> having to get in the kid's face. Um, and they're going to have some games that they can sanitize and stuff. Um Rosie and I are planning on making some food to try to sell for the parents and stuff. Um, they're right there at the beginning of a subdivision. So it's easy to kind of funnel them into that area, let them do their trunk or treat and games, and then send them back to their subdivision for actual trick or treating. So if any of you all are interested in helping with that, so we can kind of make it a parish wide event, um, please let me know because that'll be it'll be a lot of fun and it'll be a chance for us to have some fellowship together. What day of the week is that? That's a Saturday. A Saturday? Yes. Uh, that is prior to time changing. The time doesn't change until November. The following, yeah, the following week. Yeah. I'll probably help in some manner. And you would like maybe baked goods, sliced and wrapped an individual. Yeah, something like that. Like to sell a slice or brownies or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So, and it, it ends at what time? It'll be from three o'clock to five o'clock. Okay, which is in the traffic. <laughs> yeah, but well, it's not much be traffic on Saturday. There won't be that much, not on a Saturday. Not especially, right not, not, especially not in that area because mm -hmm. most of the parents will be toting their kids around. So, um, some places are canceling Halloween trick or treating, so we don't well, know yet if there's actually yeah. going to be. Well, we're in the church is in unincorporated Dorchester County, not in the city limits of North Charleston or anything like that. So it is far less likely that it would get canceled there than in the city of North Charleston. And that actually may work to our benefit because if the city cancels it, that subdivision's in the city, but they can still come up there and trick or treat if they want to. So, have they done anything like this in the past? They have previously, and they had a good turnout, so. Okay. I'll, I'll plan on trying to be there. Whether or not I get somebody to drive me remains to be seen. We'll see. Well, Barbara, I might go, and you and I can go together. Okay, if, if it's all right. I was going to say that, or we might can meet at the church and, mm -hmm. and go. See how many cars we need. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I Thank guess you can count us in. I mean, our we have a hatch, not a trunk, but we'd be willing to do. It. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm the same way. I've got a hatch too, and you know it'll be fine. So I've decorated it before. But, all right. Anybody got anything else? That's all. I think we'll let you off the hook for the night. Yep. Born <laughs> to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Be to God. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. I'm afraid to turn this thing off again. It didn't want to come back on last time. <laughs>